The following program is a color feature presentation on the HSN Television Network. This Week in Pro Football is brought to you by Hager Slacks. They just fit better naturally. And by American Motors and your local American Motors dealer. Hi, I'm Tom Brookshire. And I'm Pat Summerall. This week in the first half of our show, we'll see the Cowboys and the Dolphins as they continue to travel the winning path. We'll also see the Raiders in an amazing come-from-behind victory that seems to have become a way of life for them. And Pat, we'll also take a look at the Chiefs as they keep pace with the Raiders by shutting out the Denver Broncos. We'll also take a look at the AFC Central Division as it gets a bit shook up with a bingo win and a Steeler loss. We'll see all of those games and more right after this message. In Dallas, the Cowboys dominated every phase of their game with the Washington Redskins and registered a shutout victory. For Dallas, it started with the special teams. Two weeks ago, rookie Mark Washington, number 46, ran back a kickoff 96 yards for a touchdown against the Redskins. On Sunday, Washington came within a couple of strides of breaking another. Bob Hayes created the most excitement when he went on a weaving 70-yard odyssey with a Mike Bragg punt. Unfortunately for Hayes, a penalty canceled his flirtation with the spectacular. On defense, Dallas nullified every Redskin ruse. They ran rough shot over the crippled Washington attack and did not allow a first down in the second half. Without their league leading rusher, Larry Brown, the Redskins could not run. Without star receiver Charlie Taylor, they couldn't pass deep either. At the scavengers of the Dallas secondary, pick Sonny Jurgensen clean. On offense, Dallas was equally devastating. Even passes put up for grabs were claimed by Cowboy receivers. The Dallas offense was so well-tuned, they turned a first and 42 situation into a first down. The Cowboys scored with seeming ease. Quarterback Craig Morton found a completely uncovered Walt Garrison for one touchdown. And running back Dan Reeves found the end zone flag for another. The Cowboys rushed for over 270 yards against Washington and crushed them 34 to nothing. Next week is Cleveland and for Dallas a chance for first place in the highly competitive NFC East. In Miami there is a new breed of fan. The phenomenal success of the Dolphins has brought out the night people to see the day people play football. And both groups look astonishingly alike. Against the Boston Patriots, Miami scored on the opening kickoff when Mercury Morris rocketed to a touchdown. Mercury not only traveled 97 yards, but revved up and recorded the most prodigious spike in the NFL this year. It was an easy day for the Miami offense. 
The Dolphins specialty teams recorded their second touchdown when Lloyd Mumford sprinted 41 yards with a blocked field goal. The Patriots enjoyed a few memorable moments. Number 30, Carl Garrett, the AFL's Rookie of the Year in 1969, showed considerable persistence against the tough-hitting Dolphins. Against Miami, the Patriots scored more points than they have in the last nine weeks. Number 35, Jim Nance, scored the first of three Patriot touchdowns. Then Carl Garrett persisted again on a short smash. Boston scored a third touchdown through the air as Mike Tolliver hit Gail Kniff at the end line. But for most of the day, the Patriot quarterbacks felt the punishing wrath of the Miami front four. With each passing week, number 11, Joe Cap adds one more bruise to his battered body. Against Miami, Cap's head received equal time for number 75, Manny Fernandez. When Patriot quarterbacks were not harassed by the Miami rush, their receivers were completely blanketed by the young Dolphin secondary. While the Dolphin defense was brutal and often spectacular, the Miami offense led by setbacks Jim Kick and Larry Zonka was bruisingly efficient. Zonka's power running meted out a heavy toll on Patriot tacklers. And Kick, as gifted a receiver as he is a runner, consistently split the Patriot zones on deep swing routes. Quarterback Bob Greasy passed sparingly, but when he did, he received artful assistance from receivers like Howard Twilley, number 81. When Twilley turned cornerback Randy Beverly, number 27, completely around on a post-corner pattern, he was rewarded with a touchdown. Miami was rewarded with a 37-20 victory, an almost a sure chance to reach the AFC playoffs. And maybe, just maybe, a chance to smile in the Super Bowl. Well, Pat, in the old days, the league season would be over. Twelve weeks are gone, but now, of course, two big ones in the playoffs are ahead of all these pro teams. And I was talking to Jack Rockwell about injuries, and I said, boy, the Cardinals are lucky this year, and of course, he's the trainer for St. Louis. I said, you haven't had a bad one this year, and he almost fell over. He said, all the players, or most of them on the Cardinal team, are injured, but they're playing with pain, and just covering up and taping up and doing the job. And it reminds me that some of the real greats are playing with injuries. Uh, Charlie Johnson, back after the bad shoulder with the Houston Oilers. Leroy Kelly, with two sprained ankles, is still a great running back. Uh, Les Josephson has taken his dinner through a straw. I think he's had a broken jaw with the Rams. And, of course, Dick Butkus plays with numerous injuries all year long. And I watched Wayne Walker, the oldest lion left alive up in Detroit, uh, on a broken bone, a broken bone in his foot, catch John Gilliam, the very fine receiver for the Cardinals, from behind on a 79-yard pass play. And I don't think Wayne ever ran that fast or thought he could, but he did it with... With, with pain. So that ability to play when you're hurt is one of the things that makes him great, I guess. That's true. We'll be back to see that later on in the show, how Walker did catch Gilliam from behind. What's right. next, Pat? Well, Tom, last week the Chiefs stayed in a tie for first in the AFC West, and they did it the easy way compared to their co-leaders from Oakland, those heart-stopping, clock-beating <laughs> Raiders. Let's look at those games right now. If a Hollywood director conceived and put on film what Coach John Madden and the Oakland Raiders are accomplishing for real, the movie-going public would freak. But against the Jets at Shea Stadium, it truly looked as if the Raiders had run out of miracles. The Jets, with number 32 Emerson Boozer alive and kicking, ran successfully as Boozer gulped 115 yards. But the elements and good defense combined, and the Jets led by only 3-0 at halftime.
In the third quarter, New York's defense provided the spark. W.K. Hicks, number 33, intercepted a pass and slid 19 yards to the Raiders' 16. From there, Woodall threw a perfect pass to Pete Lamons, number 87, and the Jets led 10 to nothing. The Raiders finally scored late in the third quarter when George Blanda hit Warren Wells. But the Jets seemed destined to win. Al Atkinson made the Jets' second interception. Jim Turner kicked a field goal, and the Jets had a seemingly comfortable lead, 13-7. But with eight seconds left, it happened again. LaMonica's desperation heave found Warren Wells in the end zone, and the Jets had been just another victim in a long line of Oakland miracle finishes. The Raiders 14, the Jets 13. Although the Chiefs are very popular in Kansas City, they are by no means the only thing popular in Kansas City. The nice thing about the Chiefs, though, is that they are popular with one another. The Chiefs are definitely not popular, however, with Denver quarterback Alan Pastrana, number 12, as they dropped in on him raining fury instead of flowers. Not to seem ungrateful for the hospitality, the Broncos barged in on the Chiefs' Len Dawson on several occasions, as neither offense could generate much action. The only genuine threat on either side was the Chiefs' Ed Podolak, number 14. Kodalak has been the only constant in the Chiefs' offense thus far, as he ran for 139 yards. 65 of those yards came on the second play of the game as he scored the only touchdown of the contest. The Chiefs' other points were all set up by their defense, who looked menacingly confident. The defense intercepted five Denver passes, three by all-everything safety Johnny Robinson, number 42. Jan Stenerud booted three field goals as Kansas City held Denver scoreless for the first time in 52 games. We'll have more exciting action on this week in pro football right after this brief message. In the AFC Central, three teams were tied for first place, but now that log jam has been broken. The Green Bay Packers knocked Pittsburgh out of the lead, and in San Diego, Paul Brown, surprising Bengals, stopped the Chargers and continue to hold a share of first place. In San Diego, the Chargers met the Cincinnati Bengals, who were tied for first place in the AFC Central. Despite serious injuries, the Bengals had won four straight, the most in their history. Much of their strength has come from talented newcomers like number 20, Lamar Parrish, who raced 79 yards with a punt to give the Bengals an early lead.
The Chargers are a seasoned, talented team, but they have been somewhat erratic this year. Occasionally, number 21, John Hadle, and number 22, Dickie Post, have flashed the style that once made the Chargers a potent offensive force in pro football. Hadle's second quarter run was the only score San Diego could muster in the first half. Hadle relied on the guile and wit of nine pro years to puncture the inexperienced Bengal secondary. Although San Diego bested the Bengals in almost every statistical category, they could not put many points on the scoreboard. The Chargers scoring consisted of just two touchdowns. One of them, a fourth quarter shot to number 83, Willie Frazier. For the most part, indecision marked the Charger offense, and only occasionally did San Diego display the running game they are capable of showing. Often, the Chargers' inconsistency resulted in mistakes. The Bengals picked off three passes, and this interception by number 13, Ken Riley, set up a Cincinnati touchdown. Amazingly, Cincinnati had zero net yards passing, and it was the power bursts of Paul Robinson and number 30, Jess Phillips, that won the game for the Bengals. The 17-14 victory was Cincinnati's fifth straight, as they continue to enjoy the best season in their history. In cold, snowy Pittsburgh, the Steelers were tied for first in the AFC Central. Their talented young field generals, Terry Hanratty and Terry Bradshaw, learned a few cold weather lessons from the master of their trade. The master being Green Bay's Bart Starr. The temperature hovered around 20 degrees, and gusty winds made it even colder. But even under these conditions, Green Bay's Larry Krause, number 30, generated a lot of heat as he scorched across the frozen turf for 100 yards and a touchdown on the opening kickoff. Both receivers and defenders had a tough time distinguishing footballs from snowflakes, and often their efforts ended in empty-handed frustration. The biting cold had a greater effect on the young and inexperienced Steelers. Pittsburgh receivers saw many passes slip through their frostbitten fingers. Number 12, Terry Bradshaw, managed to thaw out for one glorious moment as he combined with number 88, Dave Smith, for an 87-yard touchdown, the second longest in Steeler history. Coming from traditionally cold Green Bay, Bart Starr is right at home in foul weather, and he punctured the frozen air for two touchdowns. The first went to number 81, Rich McGeorge.
Stars' second touchdown pass went to number 86, John Hilton, and iced a 20-12 Packer victory that dropped Pittsburgh into second place in the AFC Central. Two divisional leaders were involved in games that were important in determining their divisional championships. In Baltimore, the Colts moved to within one game of clinching the AFC Eastern title, while in Minnesota, the Vikings wrapped up the NFC Central Championship. In Minnesota, where the Vikings met the Bears, if the sight of a snowmobile on a snowless field seemed strange, it was only the forebearer of what was to come. The Bears took the stage first, with Ron Smith, the first performer. Smith casualed over to a Viking punt and tried his version of steal the bacon. Don Shy provided the next act when he batted a pass back over his head right into Wally Hilgenberg's hand. Jack Cannon wrapped up the sideshow with his version of the drop back. Not to be outdone, Bob Lee, number 19, performed the drop back with handoff. The Vikings showed more diversification, for they had Dave Osborne, who could do the drop back too. Not surprisingly, the score at halftime was 6-6. The Vikings relied on the rushes of Dave Osborne. He gained 139 yards for the day, third highest in Viking history, and Clint Jones tacked on 61 more. The Bears, on the other hand, moved on the passes of Jack Concannon to league-leading receiver Dick Gordon. Lee, filling in for injured Gary Quazzo, managed one touchdown pass, a 33-yarder to John Henderson. Along with three field goals by Fred Cox, the Vikings led 16-6. But following his third three-pointer, he made the mistake of kicking the ball to Cecil Turner, who sprinted 88 yards to bring the Bears close at Turner's fourth kickoff return touchdown of the season, tying Travis Williams' 1967 record. But it wasn't enough as the Vikings clinched the NFC Central title and sent their fans home happy. Well, most of them anyway. In Baltimore, the Colts and Eagles met in the first annual Dust Bowl. A Colt win would put them one game away from their division title, and at least one fan tried to avoid looking ahead to their next game. Led by Tim Rosovich, number 82, the young, tough Philadelphia defense had kept the Eagles in many games this season. The defense set up the only Eagle touchdown this day when they blocked a punt. Ron Medved took it to the one-yard line, setting up Norm Sneed's sneak for the score. Al Nelson intercepted a John United's pass to give the Eagles more good field position. But Sneed couldn't move the offense all day against the hard-hitting Colts. The Eagles' longest run of the day was by Bill Bradley after a bobble while in punt formation. The Colt defense not only held the Eagles at bay, but put points on the scoreboard, too.
Jerry Logan picked Ben Hawkins' pocket and ran 33 yards for a touchdown. The defense also set up a touchdown when Norm Sneed threw from behind a smoke screen into Charlie Stooks' hands. Stooks' return set up a nine-yard end around by Eddie Hinton. On offense, the cold running game was supposedly non-existent, but led by Sam Haverlack, cold runners amassed 150 yards rushing. Colts managed another score when United's team with John Mackey for 14 yards and a touchdown. When the dust had cleared, the Colts had a 29-10 victory and were one game away from the AFC Eastern Division title. Tom, I paid a visit to the Giant locker room after their win last Sunday at Yankee Stadium over the Buffalo Bills. And I was impressed and surprised, really, with the amount of respect that all of the players had for that Buffalo team. They were of the opinion that when, once they get their injured players back, guys like O.J. Simpson and the like, they're going to be a fine football team. And almost unanimously, the Giants felt that they would rather play somebody like the team that they play this week, the St. Louis Cardinals, mm -hmm. than somebody like the Buffalo Bills, whom they have not played before, even in preseason games. It was sort of an unknown quantity that they faced there. They had scouting reports, certainly, but... They didn't really know what to, to expect from the people that were, they, were, they were facing on the field. And they dreaded that, I think. They would rather play somebody like St. Louis, in spite of the amount of respect that they have for people like Larry Wilson and Jackie Smith and the rest of the Cardinal players. They at least have a book on them, and they think they know what to expect. I guess it's the old fear of the unknown. Well, that's for sure, Pat. We'll take a look, by the way, at the win, the New York Giants over Buffalo a little bit later on. Last week, the Rams and the 49ers both won to maintain a tie for the lead in the NFC West. The Rams seem to have very little trouble in winning, but for the 49ers, it was a real struggle. Let's take a look at those games right now. San Francisco's moldering Kizar Stadium has framed 24 gloomy years of 49er frustration. 24 seasons have come and gone without a championship, and now time was running out for the old stadium. As the 49ers took the field for the last regular season game in Kizar, history seemed determined to repeat itself. San Francisco was clinging desperately to a first place tie in the West, but against Atlanta, the malevolent cosmos of Kizar struck again. The ball seemed to gravitate away from the 49ers and even John Brody, enjoying the finest season of his career, had trouble directing it into the proper hands. Number 36, Ken Reeves, came up with one interception as Brody had trouble throwing into a defense which seemed to consist of more than the allowable 11. Things got so bad that misfortune became the rule each time the 49ers put the ball in play. Number 71, John Zook lost a score when Brody's pass was ruled incomplete. But with the way things were going, Atlanta had only to line up again and be a little patient. Number 22, John Mallory took his turn to scamper in. And this time it was worth six points as Brody began to feel those old familiar Kizar blues. Number 17, Bob Berry helped grease the 49ers slide by going to his heavy artillery. Robust Jim Mitchell hauled in from the 46, then slipped 12 yards to take a play action pitch for a commanding Atlanta advantage. The Falcons had momentum and history on their side, but for once the 49ers may have the gods of Kizar on theirs.
Ken Benyard's missed extra point gave San Francisco an opening, and John Brody found the key. Go to Gene Washington. Go to Gene Washington even when he is covered. Three times in the second half, Washington was interfered with, setting up two short Ken Willard touchdown plunges. The second gave the 49ers a 21-20 lead. And with this inspiration, the San Francisco defense blitzed Atlanta into submission. A field goal was added as the 49ers fought to a gutsy 24-20 comeback win. The saga of Kizar may yet end with a championship. In Los Angeles, the Rams sought to keep pace in the West by stabilizing their bumpy 1970 performance. During their up and down season, the Rams' spirit had never slackened, but somewhere along the line, the offense got lost. And now against New Orleans, it once again appeared to be in a state of suspended animation. For its part, the Ram defense had been accused of senility. The Saints found enough creases in the old guard to set up three Tom Dempsey field goals, including a 54-yarder. Ram fans were bored with the plotting offense, and George Allen was concerned with a quick 3-0 St. Lee. But despite the worst midseason slump since Allen arrived in 1966, Los Angeles has the tools of a superpower. Number 18, Roman Gabriel, brought the slumbering offense to life by going back to basics. Number 34, Les Josephson, swung out of the backfield for solid gains. And then, behind the power blocking of number 71, Joe Shabelli, he thundered in for the first Ram score. Suddenly, it was like old times. Gabriel standing tall in the pocket, throwing rainmakers. And Jack Snow running alone when the shot came down. The Sunshine Supermen and their fans were a happy clan once more, and thinking about Miami in January. The Los Angeles defense had set out to prove they were not yet feeble. The old men attacked with a passion as number 17, Billy Kilmer, learned the true meaning of throwing under pressure. The Ram bomb squads were also playing with purpose. With their first punt rush, they came up with a penalty. But with their second, they came up with the ball. On this day, the Rams were not about to waste an opportunity, and Josephson bulled in for his second score. Gabriel kept pouring on the heat as he closed out his best yardage day since the third week of the season with a toss here to Billy Truax. Several weeks ago, some experts were counting them out, but with a smashing 31-16 victory over the Saints, the Los Angeles team remained tied for first in their division. The Hard Rock Rams seemed to be back poised and ready for the rigors of the coming stretch drive. Last week, St. Louis had their unbeaten streak broken by the Detroit Lions. At the same time, the Giants were beating the Bills to crawl within one half game of the division-leading Cardinals. And even that half game lead is virtually meaningless since the Giants and Cards meet this week. Last week in Yankee Stadium, the Giants welcomed the Bills with a surprise as Pete Gogolak opened the game 
with a perfectly executed onside kick. That unexpected opening kept the Bills off balance, and number 10, Fran Tarkenton, took advantage of their discomfort with a strike to number 18, Clifton McNeil. However, before the Giants could score, the Bills regrouped and stopped them cold. The Bills themselves could generate little offense as rookie quarterback Dennis Shaw, number 16, was blitzed and mugged repeatedly throughout the afternoon. But the Rookie of the Year candidate did finally get things going with his completion to the AFC's leading receiver, Marlon Briscoe. However, when Shaw got within scoring range, the young signal caller found that luck had run out on him. But the Bills did muster a 6-3 halftime lead on the toe of Grant Guthrie. And at the intermission, Coach Webster of the Giants told his team, quote, if you play the same way in the second half, you've blown all you've worked for. The New Yorkers took heed and Les Shy returned the second half kickoff 62 yards to set up a field goal. From there, talking and hit number 24, Tucker Fredrickson for one touchdown. Then he came right back to Clifton McNeil with another. The Giants had a 20 to six victory, which was made all the sweeter by the Cardinal loss in Detroit. In Detroit's blustery Tiger Stadium, the NFL's two highest scoring teams met. As Joe Schmidt's Lions were ready to devour their third straight division leader, Charlie Winner's St. Louis Cardinals. It was a collision that had the experts looking for ways to describe the action. The first half was mired in mistakes. One Detroit threat was stopped by Miller Farr, number 20, a hard-hitting defensive back whose brother Mel, number 24, is better suited to offense. The longest play of the game was a 79-yard Jim Hart pass play to John Gilliam, whose smooth strides would have carried him to a St. Louis touchdown had he not been caught from behind by linebacker Wayne Walker, number 55. A punt muffed by number 20, Lim Barney, set up the game's first three points. A punt muffed by number 26, Chuck Lotterette, set up the game's next three points. Altogether, Lotterette was charged with three of the Cardinals' five fumbles. The next score was set up by the Lions' longest play, a 44-yard pass to Earl McCullough, with Roger Worley hanging on. Again, the field goal was the only successful means of scoring as a Greg Landry pass to Alty Taylor missed connections in the end zone. In the final minutes of the first half, another St. Louis fumble gave Detroit and Greg Landry another scoring chance. Number 88, Detroit tight end Charlie Sanders was stopped just short of the St. Louis goal. And for the third time in the half, the Lions had been denied a touchdown by the narrowest of margins. Just three seconds before the gun, place kicker Errol Mann was called in to boot his third field goal, and the Lions took a slim 9-3 lead at the half. Jim Hart would love to forget the second half. 
Two promising drives were stopped by two limb Barney interceptions. Detroit pressure poured in from all sides as the Lions limited the NFC's leading offense to a meager ration of just six first downs. The crusher was applied by the offensive far, Detroit's Mel, as the very much alive Lions cut St. Louis Eastern lead to just a half game over Dallas and the New York Giants. Well, Pat, I'm the stubborn type, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I think the Detroit Lions may be the best second place team in football. Well, their big win last week set up a big one for this week. The Giants at St. Louis. Oh, boy. I'm going to go with the Cardinals because I think their rushing game will come back, and I believe they can run that football against the Giants. The Giants are sort of a mysterious team. They don't appear really to have that, that much talent, but they do have a lot of momentum going right now, and they do seem to be able to win for some strange reason week after week. You're going with New York? I'll go with New York. I'll go with St. Louis. How about Los Angeles and Detroit? Well, I know you like Detroit. You seem to be uh, struck with them. I'm committed, yes. I'll go with Detroit, I think, over the Rams. I've been very much impressed uh, the last two weeks particularly with the way the Rams have moved the ball on offense. So I'll take Los Angeles. And Roman Gabriel's healthy, right? Right. All of them are big games, though, really, this week because there are still 14 teams left in the race. At any rate, we'll be back next week to show you what happens. I'm Tom Brookshire. And I'm Pat Summerall. And we'll see you next week. This Week in Pro Football has been brought to you by American Motors and your local American Motors dealer. By Hager Slacks. They just fit better naturally. Promotional consideration is provided by American Motors, makers of the bold new 1971 Javelin, with styling so hairy we even risk turning some people off. Javelin by American Motors.